Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Office Hours. Um, I am Purva Ashok, and I'm joining you all today from um, Toronto, from the traditional territories of uh, many nations, including the Mississaugas of the First Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Hooded Oshani, uh, and the Wendat peoples. I'm very grateful to be living and working here and to be able to join and learn from all of you wonderful people in the open education community uh, virtually. Uh, in case you haven't seen or met me before, um, I am Apoor Varshuk from Rebus Community. We are a Canadian charity that helps educational institutions build human capacity in OER publishing and open education more generally through professional development. We also um, offer a lot of free open guides and resources and organize um, sessions like this one, office hours, with our excellent partners, the Open Education Network. So I'm going to pass it over to Karen to tell you a little bit about herself um, and the Open Education Network. Hi, everybody, and thank you, Akurva. I'm Karen Lauritsen. <laughs> I'm Publishing Director with the Open Education Network, and I am joining you today from San Luis Obispo, California, the traditional land of the Northern Chumash. And I, too, am excited to be with all of you and learn with you today. Uh, we're going to be talking about instructional design for OER. And if this is your first office hours, I'll just introduce you to the format briefly. Uh, we will hear from three guests today who will speak informally about their experiences uh, with instructional design for OER. And then we will look to all of you to direct the conversation, ask questions, share your local experiences, um, and otherwise kind of uh, guide us in making this a useful and helpful hour for you. So, um, Let's see. Oh, yes, the Open Education Network. <laughs> uh, if, if you are not familiar with the OEN, uh, we are a community of higher ed professionals who are supporting one another in making things more open. So um, thank you for that. And I think without further ado, I'll go ahead and in, uh, introduce our guests. We uh, are joined today by Heather Capret. She is senior media developer and instructional designer with Cleveland State University. Clint Lalonde, who is project manager with BC Campus and Verena Roberts, who is the ZTC lead instructional designer at Thompson <laughs> Rivers University. And I believe we're gonna kick things off today with Heather. Hi guys, um, I just wanna say thank you very much for having me today. Um, I'm gonna start off with screen sharing a couple slides and I'm gonna take you to a press book that some students, theater students worked on actually. Okay, so bear with me here. Um, so here's my contact information in case you want to get a hold of me later. And um, I'm going to put my slides and some other resources in a Google Drive folder, and I'll paste that in chat after I'm done speaking. Um, so part of our affordable learning initiative at CSU includes textbook affordability grants that we offer to our faculty. And those were kicked off in 2016 by our former library director, Glenda Thornton. Absolutely love the woman, <laughs> um, I miss her. Um, she offered grants to faculty wanting to adopt and adapt an open textbook or OER to their course, and also to those who wanted to write an open textbook. So the technologies that we have at CSU are um, a self-hosted press books. We administrate that on campus. It has the H5P plugin. It also has Hypothesis, and we use Blackboard Learn as our LMS. Um, we do offer professional development courses to faculty to learn about OERs and open pedagogy, and there's a couple of them with a stipend. Um, uh, one is called the Textbook Affordability Summer Symposium, and I co-facilitate that with a couple other people in the uh, OER committee at CSU. And so, um, faculty turn over their syllabi to an OER librarian, and she maps out uh, possible open textbooks and other OER or library licensed content to the topics within the syllabus. And so within this course, faculty um, 
we ask them to review their OER and if uh, they review an open textbook in the OTL, uh, she can publish it there. And I also have them go through an exercise where they do a mini course alignment map for one or two modules in their course. So they're introduced to Bloom's taxonomy and they create measurable learning objectives with those action verbs from Bloom's taxonomy. And then they, they map those to the chapters or the sections in their open textbook that support those learning objectives. And they also list their learning activities and their assignments and tests that are gonna measure the achievement of those learning objectives. And I have an example of a course alignment map in the Google Drive folder. Um, I also have an open pedagogy and press book course. And we have an OER librarian that talks to them about Creative Commons licensing, copy, copyright, and gives the open textbook workshop. Um, so as an instructional designer, um, what I do varies. Uh, I get paired up with people that uh, are awarded the textbook affordability grant. And if they don't have a course shell already in Blackboard, I can make a copy of our CSU course template, which is based on quality matters standards um, to provide a development shell for them. I can help them locate OER and place links to those within their uh, Blackboard development course. Uh, as an example, one professor who was doing African American literature asked me to find ex slave narratives. So I did a search on YouTube and placed some links in there for her to pick and choose from. Um, she was also interested in a library licensed um, documentaries on, I think it was called um, Africa's greatest or greatest civilizations of Africa. Uh, so I gave her the links to that. I provide training on technologies such as Blackboard, H5P, and Pressbooks to faculty and students. Occasionally, I get to develop creative comment or um, sorry, excuse me. I get to delay develop creative content for the open textbooks. So one is an example of. Um, I did it in Camtasia. It's a narrative explaining the symbolism in a painting of Durga, who's a Hindu goddess. And her the objects that are in her hands are all linked to spots on the timeline, which explain the symbolism of those objects. And I get to help write creative assignments for students. So one such assignment was for introduction to theater students. And we had them create interactive learning content and knowledge checks for other students and for the public. They got published in a press book at CSU and they could pick any of the content types that they wanted um, within h5p.org. So here's like an example. There's interactive videos that have spots on the timeline that jump to websites that give more information about the topic. And at the end, you can put questions in or intersperse questions on the timeline to gauge understanding of the content. There's like a course presentation tool. They can build quizzes. Some of them did timelines over like the history of Greek theater or costume design process. And so what I'll do is escape out of here and I'll take you to the press book. Uh, here it is. And if you scroll down, the very first chapter here has all of the information about the assignment and the open textbook that they used. And you're welcome to adopt it and adapt it to your institution if you want to. It has suggested learning objectives for the assignment. There's a rubric for grading with criteria and levels of achievement for each of those criteria. We did want them to cite their sources, so using MLA. Um, there's language here that you can copy and paste into a Blackboard or other LMS assignment tool. And this helps the faculty member with grading. So it explains uh, somewhere in here, it shows like what they're supposed to turn in. Essentially, Here's a screenshot of this H5P plugin area in the press book. So they would turn in their title and their H5P ID so that she could match it up later. 
I did create all the accounts in the press book and I created the announcement that sent the invitation to them to join. And I reminded them to do it within 72 hours because it would expire and I'd have to like recreate it, the account and resend it. And I have links to tutorials here on like what is Pressbooks and H5P and how to build various content types. So very quickly, I just wanna show one example. Um, this is a interactive video that was done by a theater major, Dylan Sell. And he went behind the scenes of a student production called Company and interviewed all the, the people in the various roles with the development of the production. So, um, um, and what she does. All right, so this is a stage manager position. I can see. The so everywhere on this timeline, you see a little dot. He's got a link to a website that talks more about that role. And at the very end, he has some questions to gauge understanding of the content. So who prepares the actors vocally? That's actually the music director. And if, sorry for the music. If somebody misses something, they can retry the question. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to the next presenter, uh, Verena. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. That's difficult to follow. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm just going to um, read a little bit, actually, and not use PowerPoint. So you can close your eyes <laughs> for a second. <clears throat> So hello everyone, I am coming to you today from Treaty 6 territory in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, which is a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place and traveling route of the Cree, Salto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene and Nakota Sioux. I want to acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. And I'm going to talk to you a bit today about the potential of open learning design as an instructional designer to create a ripple effect. As an open learning designer, or as we're often called an instructional designer who advocates for the use of OER and open educational practices, depending on your context, I am currently working with Thompson's River Un Rivers University, TRU, in Kamloops, BC, helping to facilitate the new course redesign to create a ZTC, a zero textbook cost, associate science degree pathway for our students. In most cases, this means that we are redesigning and updating our current open learning courses with OER and um, open educational practices. At TRU Open Learning, as an instructional designer, we work with subject matter experts known as the developers and consultants from all over North America. I've been lucky enough to work with TRU campus faculty themselves, Canadian instructors from multiple institutions and faculty from colleges across the US. What I want to focus on today, though, is the importance of designing for open from the beginning, specifically what do you intentionally choose to do as an instructional designer or instructor from the beginning of the course design to ensure that your course will be student centered and sustainable for you and others in the future. I start by encouraging you to think about how my or your personal actions and contributions will promote or encourage a positive ripple effect for others in everything you design. I always think about the possible positive impact of my course design in order to build for sustainability within a larger e learning ecosystem. For example, when we considered student-centered learning for our Biology 1113 course, which is the first course you take as an undergraduate student at our university, we discovered that linking to outside press books wasn't enough. So we needed to learn how to download and adapt and recreate new TRU versions of the press books in order to ensure that the content was personalized for our students in authentic and meaningful ways. At our university in particular, we have a larger indigenous population. So we needed to ensure that we could adapt and, and integrate some content so that students could actually see, feel, hear themselves within the content. From an accessibility and infra infrastructure point of view, the open content that we linked to was often adapted and changed without our knowledge, and what we thought we were linking to was not always correct. 
By creating TRU OER adaptions of Pressbooks, the students are aware of the possibilities of open content and have multiple additional open links and resources in which to expand their learning to clarify and expand upon their understanding of topics. Because when you adapt a press book, you also have to include where you got the content from and the students will go back and go down multiple rabbit holes um, learning about new things. In terms of student experience, as we consider other copyright options for our students, we are aware that students are often given the option to buy additional resources to practice learning the content. For example, in biology and in my chemistry courses, they're often given multiple interactive um, assignments and additional activities that they can do if they choose to buy um, the, the publishable content. So it's kind of like, how do we um, meet the needs of our students when we're competing against um, really great interactive content? So. As such, we expanded our OER course design to include open homework systems while we were developing our course. And we learned how to support these systems at our institution. So you can't just integrate an open homework system without ensuring that you can actually integrate it at your institution into your learning management system. These innovative pilots helped us to make connections with LibreTex and adapt homework systems where we started to learn about the possible future of open learning and instructional design. LibreTex does also help us find files and openly accessible content that we can remix and reuse more easily in our courses. Building and participating within an open community becomes essential when de designing for open. So by intentionally designing for open learning from the beginning, you are advocating for the ripple effect and unlimited learning potential. What I didn't mention today is also the work that I have done co-designing press books and other OER with my students, and I look forward to answering questions about this process as well. Thank you, and I pass it over to Clint. Thanks, Marina. And a nice shout out to LibreTex and their work there too. Uh, my name is Clint Lalonde, everyone. My pronouns are he and him, and I'm joining you today from the uh, traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking people of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. Uh, I've been a settler on these uh, lands since 1994, originally from Treaty 6 territory, right around where Verena is actually, uh, for the uh, land of the Cree, Chippewan, and Stony Nations. Um, so I'm an open education project manager with an organization called BC Campus. If you're not familiar with BC Campus, we uh, uh, provide uh, shared services around open education and open educational resource grants in the province of British Columbia, working with the 25 publicly funded post-secondary institutions. So we do a lot of collaborative projects and a lot of collaborative content development. Uh, one of our big projects is our open textbook project, uh, which has been going on since 2012. Uh, currently a repository of about 400 openly licensed textbooks and uh, open education resource guides. Uh, created or curated for uh, for faculty here in uh, the province of British Columbia. Um, uh, so I don't have an uh, instructional designer in my title. Uh, however, I've done quite a bit of instructional design influenced work in the OER work that I've done for the past decade. And I always try to bring some ID principles to the open education work that I do. And I actually think that that open education and OER, the creation especially of open educational resources is a really good sort of Trojan horse to introduce the concept of instructional design to instructors. Uh, it, we often work with in the post-secondary system, people who are not trained in education, they're subject matter experts. Um, so they don't often have a grounding in learning theories or, or, or how, to, how to design a, a course or how to design a lesson plan. And sometimes working in OER can, uh, can be a really good opportunity to have those conversations with instructors. Uh, as we're talking about the resources, we're also talking about how to integrate those resources, how to make sure they align with your learning outcomes, and how to make sure that you can actually assess uh, your, your learning outcomes in your course. So, so it's a really good opportunity to have those conversations with instructors. I thought uh, maybe what I do today is talk about um, how instructional design is kind of influenced some of the work that I have done uh, on some of the open education projects that uh, I've managed here at BC campus. Um, the, I mentioned the open textbook project. That's a big project that's been going on since uh, 2012. 
uh, and I've been working on that uh, on and off for the past 10 years. Um, when I first started with the Open Textbook Project, and when we first got this uh, Open Textbook Project, I mean, one of the first things we wanted to do was find out what actually makes a textbook. Like, what's, a, what's the difference between a textbook and just like a regular source of information? Um, so I did a deep dive into some of the research around what makes a textbook. And really, I was looking at things like pedagogical aids, like what are the things in the textbook that can really help students understand um, um, the content better? So I've just posted a link to a blog post that I wrote around 2014, uh, where I synthesized some of the research I was finding about what are some of the pedagogical features of a, of a textbook. And this is where I sort of, this is the first area where I, I looked at trying to incorporate some instructional design thinking around the creation of open resources, like an open textbook. Uh, and it was really interesting research because I actually found that, you know, some of the things that were really useful for students and helped with their learning were, were things that were quite basic in a textbook. Um, things like uh, bold and italicized terms, um, chapter summaries and chapter reviews, and practice questions. Those were really useful for students, and that would come back uh, uh, a little bit later or come forward uh, in some of the work that I've been doing recently, uh, this idea of practice questions. Uh, from there, I also took a look at, uh, we, we did quite a bit of creation of textbooks. Um, I did an, a, a project called an open textbook sprint, where we created uh, an open geography textbook localized here for British Columbia with a group of, uh, there was about 10 people. We locked ourselves in a room at UBC for five days. And at the end of it, we came out with a textbook. And so uh, these people were instructors. Uh, so we wanted to try to uh, incorporate some instructional design into the creation of the textbook. So one of the first things we did is we sat down and we talked about the kinds of learning that happens within their discipline. And they hit upon this idea of service learning as being very important uh, within their discipline. So we actually used that as kind of a guiding principle as we created the textbook. And we incorporated a lot of service learning type activities in the actual content of the textbook. Uh, and along the way too, we also created this, which was a five rules of textbook development that kind of helped us structure the textbook and some sort of big picture ideas um, that were pulled um, uh, from, from some research uh, around um, how to structure a textbook to make it a really good uh, learning resource for students. Um, we also did a, a, another sprint where we created um, a, a test bank for um, an open psychology textbook that we had. And we brought together, in that case, there was 20 faculty over the course of a weekend. Uh, we brought them together and we just banged out questions to, uh, to create a, a test bank to go along uh, with a, an open textbook. Uh, and along the way, that allowed us to have conversations around how do you actually create a really good question that will actually challenge students. And so we, we dove deep into, you know, what makes a good uh, a multiple choice question? Uh, how, do you, how do you construct these? I mean, there's, there's, a, there's some good um, work that has been done around how to construct uh, good things like distractors within your multiple choice questions to make sure that you're providing students with something that may seem like the right answer, and they may go, mm, that is the right answer, but they're not quite sure. So it kind of distracts them a little bit and makes them really think about the question. So it gave us an opportunity to work with 20 faculty members around things like how to create uh, really good questions. Uh, and then the second project uh, is one, uh, Verena actually mentioned it a little bit, the Open Homework Systems Project that I've been managing here for the last couple of years in British Columbia, uh, where, where we uh, looked at creating questions and took a, an even deeper dive into how to structure questions using H5P as uh, as our tool. Um, so we put together some resources, not only about how to use uh, H5P, but also how to incorporate the questions into a textbook so that it made sense and helped students learn. So uh, it was, again, a good opportunity to speak with faculty about things like, um, like learning sciences, like uh, things like retrieval practice and interleaving and the spacing effect and, and how to design your textbooks and your questions in a way that kind of takes advantage of some of these learning science principles, uh, which to me are, are sort of the part of instructional design uh, principles and, and how to make sure that you're creating resources that actually help students uh, with their learning. Um, so I'm going to stop there. That's kind of my, my high level overview and uh, uh, pass it back and uh, see if we can 
use any of the discussions that we've heard here from the, in these three presentations as a basis of, of a discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you all, all three of you, Clint, Verena, Heather, for sharing just sort of what the tip of the iceberg is of your expertise as either official instructional designers or what did you, what term did you use, Verena? Open learning designers. Um, this is really the time uh, of our one hour conversation where we turn it over to all of you, uh, all of our attendees and participants today for questions and comments. Um, feel free to drop your questions into the chat. Um, if you wanted to unmute your microphone and ask any of our three speakers a question out loud, you're welcome to do so. I know that uh, Veronica has posted a question uh, in the chat while uh, you three were presenting. Uh, Veronica is curious if there is an existing community of practice for instructional designers working in open education. Do any of you know of one? Is there a, a secret hideout spot for instructional designers in the, in the field? Uh, the Open Education Network has instructional designers at their institutions. So, you know, for me, that's my go to. I, I'm on their list serv, so I get the emails through Gmail, and that helps me. Anybody else? Um, I put Twitter. <laughs> Just Twitter. <laughs> uh, because I think that's where I connect with everyone. Um, but that's a really good point, Heather. I that there's potential area for growth in this in in this community. So uh, I, I think that's a really great question. Yeah, Veronica, that's a really good point. Clinch, do you know of one for um, across the province in BC? Do you do you bring instructional designers together at times? Um, yeah, we always we try to 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 have uh, we have a number of of different communities of practice here in British Columbia. We have a um, ETUG, which is our educational technology user group, which contains a number of instructional designers. Um, uh, and after the fact, I know Emily, who is here, I saw was quite involved with uh, ETUG. She's an instructional designer at uh, Camosun College. Um, we also have a number of uh, informal things like uh, we have listservs uh, with uh, the, where we have a number of instructional designers that uh, participate. Um, we we have a number of instructional designers that work at BC campus that uh, you know have have informal networks of instructional designers. So um, so I know those things exist. I think instructional designs. There, are, there is a there is a discipline of instructional design, and there are conferences and um, and groups uh, associated. None that are really specific to open, though, which I think does bring, uh, you know, when you're designing uh, open resources or open courses or working with students on open pedagogy pro uh, projects, it does bring its own special challenges. So I think there's definitely room to to have something for instructional designers. So I pasted a link to the Quality Matters annual member meeting for like, we have a consortium in Ohio and it's an, a nonprofit that's dedicated to quality online learning. It's not specific to open, uh, but I would imagine you could weave in like open topics that, you know, if you wanna present, that would be something to present at. Thank you all. And if there are other suggestions from participants, you know, please feel free to put them in the chat. We have a very active chat, and I know that um, a lot of you are joining us from different regions that may have similar um, groups. So speaking of the chat, Stephanie had a question about H5P and if there is a resource anyone can recommend or training that's provided for H5P. Oh, sure, I added I can, your oh. link, Clint. Sorry, I put, oh, did you? Oh, okay. I put the kitchen in already. <laughs> yeah, just sorry, I thought I could tell you I already did that. But anyway, go on, keep going. Yeah, I, I was just going to mention the kitchen, the H5P kitchen. Uh, when I was uh, for the Open Homework Systems Project, uh, we created a website for our grantees, but it's open. Uh, and uh, it, it does 
have some basics around H5P and some links back to some tutorials, uh, some webinars there. But it also has some instructional resources around the things that I was talking about, like how to actually create good questions, how to provide robust feedback that is actually going to be useful for students. Uh, and so we tried to use that as sort of a, a, a hub for not only the technical how to use H5P, but also how to pedagogically use it in a way, in a manner that's going to help with students learning. So, yeah. Thank you all. Um, I know Adrian's posted a question in the chat and Melissa has a hand up. So Melissa, I'm gonna let you jump in and we'll get back to Adrian's two questions shortly. Okay, great. Hi, this is amazing. Um, I have a fair amount of instructional design experience, but only some moderate experience with OER, not anywhere near, especially in terms of construction, I'm pretty new. And I just came into a role where we're trying to build some courses that are focused around OER um, and then offer the entire courses as OER, um, probably nationally throughout the United States, aligned to um, some teaching national teaching standards. I'm wondering, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed, <laughs> to say the least. Also very excited about um, uh, what we might be able to do. I, I guess my big question is when you're sort of working by committee <laughs> with a lot of subject matter experts and you need to, and you're working in a space that needs to be carefully mapped out and aligned, do you have some advice on, on what as an instructional designer kind of keeps your head clear or helps you kind of keep track of how the mapping process is happening up front? Uh, so we do course alignment maps, right? you know, that I talked about earlier. And that's not only, it, it's just helpful, I think, for planning and organizing a course, but we do it, um, to try to meet quality matters standards because they're very big on alignment, course alignment, you know, having those measurable learning objectives. And, you know, they start with action verbs from Bloom's taxonomy and just making sure that everything that is chosen as far as like um, course materials, learning activities and assessments meet and support those learning objectives. Yep. Yeah, I appreciate that. And Heather, we have briefly crossed paths because of QM. I, you are familiar to me uh, okay. with that. So, um, but yeah, um, that's, I think, absolutely a great point. I think um, the worry I have is, is the design by committee part, I think, a little bit too, right? Too many um, hands. Yeah, too, yep. too many hands. And I'll, um, I'll just mention one more thing and then I'll hush because there are lots of excited people and very cool things going on in the chat, which is why I love instructional designers. We use the chat. It's great. Um, but my other thing uh, that I'm wondering about is part of the grant I'm working on had promised personalized learning within an OER environment. And I'm trying to, I mean, obviously branching is the feasible like option for that, but um, I'm wondering if any of you have worked with that kind of approach within your OER. Um, I know H5P gives you some opportunities, but. So are you talking, you're talking about like them coming up with their own learning objectives? I think the idea is different learners are going to, going to be coming in at different places as they engage with this material. So based on what their individualized needs, learning needs are, how um, that might determine the way that they navigate through the material or how they're guided through the material, if that makes sense. So branching, yeah, right? But I'm wondering what your experience has been with trying to make that a bit more sophisticated in the engagement, more interactive within your OER and yeah. Um, so I've, I've never designed a course where, you know, there's some pre-assessment and people start at different levels or, you know, wherever they fit in. Uh, with the H5P assignment, it was revolved around constructionism, learning theory. So, you know, they're actively learning by reviewing the content and constructing new knowledge based on that. Um, so that's that's kind of where that assignment is coming from. <laughs> um, Melissa, would these um, courses have someone facilitate or not? 
feel like I'm hijacking here. I will just say um, the idea is that anyone who uses these courses in an OER space would be able to to facilitate. In fact, one of the things they're suggesting is that there may need to be an instructor's guide written to go with the prepackaged courses yeah. that I would be writing. <laughs> so um, anyway, I'm just feeling a little bit overwhelmed and thinking, let's start by getting really immersed in this community. So I can stop there, but lots of cool things that you all are doing. Very exciting. So I would yeah. suggest looking at P2P. It's peer to peer and the way that they've developed online courses and they've been doing it for years before we even thought about <laughs> like OER or open um, because it gives you a more informal community based way of thinking about developing flexible multi options for all learners with content with yeah so then you're it it. And I, and I have uh, taken quality matters, like obviously as instructional designers, we have expectations that we need to meet, right. but I tend to expand from quality matters in that I integrate formal and informal learning environments. And I think that you might want to develop a community with like a hashtag while developing the content as well. Anyway, peer to peer, and, and I know Clint will probably have some suggestions too, but I think that Thank my you. way to go. I'll definitely check that out. Melissa, I'll just say thank you so much for being so vulnerable and for giving us a chance also to deep dive a little bit into the the ID instructional design methods. I can see with Verena and Heather's questions of wanting to understand your context a bit more before offering a single path forward. And I think uh, there's probably many of us in that space who are coming in perhaps new to instructional design, wondering what are the best ways to begin? <laughs> um, and Phenomenal. So, You've done a lot of writing about um, H5P and branching scenarios. Perhaps you can highlight uh, in the chat uh, um, some blog posts or sessions of the H5P Kitchen from last year where several of your grantees talked about um, the uh, learning activities they created. Yeah, and we actually did one uh, specific around branching scenarios um, uh, and with, uh, I think it was Arlie Crothers at uh, KPU who did it, who actually had used a branching scenario for H5P. H5P. She did a keynote for a conference that uh, BC Campus had put on a few years ago, and she did her whole entire keynote as a choose your own adventure based on a branching scenario she had created in H5P. So at various points, she would stop and pull the audience and say, what path do we want to go down now? and then and then take the keynote down that way it was really unique and an interesting way to use the branching scenario but i'll dig up a post for you and post it uh in the chat thanks clint we'll turn to adrian's questions that he posted in the chat a little bit ago and um, this is for any of our guests do you link faculty with other staff in your institution to help share practice do any of you run communities for faculty who are implementing aspects of open educational practices So at TRU, we have an open um, education committee. And within that committee, we have what they've described as the, they're the key atom. And then they have these little electrons that go around the key the, the founding atom of open. And I'm an electron and I lead the open research committee or community of practice. But we also have a community of practice for open pedagogy. And we have one for open publishing and we have one for OER. And so these are communities of practice that any faculty can join um, from anywhere like anywhere, I guess. Um, the other things that I definitely would suggest are considering um, looking at GoGN. GoGN is the Global Open Graduate Network. Um, and, and Adrian's part of that network, so I'm speaking to him as well. But GoGN has some resources to help with this as well in order to really help develop awareness across your institution. Um, and I did like the idea is that you can't do this alone. So I was, it's, it's about finding allies in your institution and working with them to support what they're doing, a great idea, and then say, have you considered this, but never go in with, never go in in an instructional design conversation saying, this is what we're doing. Instead, it's, what mm -hmm. are you doing? <laughs> 
<laughs> and have you considered? <laughs> or maybe not even have you considered. It's just, what are you doing? Um, and the great Alan November um, always said, go in with a cup of tea. So when I think of working with our faculty and members, every time you want to say something, literally have your tea and take a sip. <laughs> or imagine taking a sip because the more the faculty and others talk about what they want to do, the more you'll figure out how to connect those open ideas that you may have or those, those OER connections or links that you may have. So I hope that gives you some ideas, Adrian, and all the different ways. I mean, we have some set formal communities of practice, but then there's the informal, how do we do it as well. Thanks, Serena. I appreciate too, sort of the top tips for starting conversations and strategies for kind of opening things up with curiosity and, and getting those conversations going. Um, it also reminds me of a conversation we've just been having in the OEN uh, that Cheryl Casey uh, shared some resources that I just put in the chat. She read, uh, she led a faculty learning community uh, for Pressbooks. Uh, did not have a lot of uh, funding or other resources. And so that was a way to bring faculty together and support them as they developed OER. So she um, shares the, the content that she used for those learning communities. And I went ahead and, and put that link there in the chat. Um, Heather, Clint, um, please feel free to uh, chime in if there's anything you'd like to add to that question. We do have another one from Veronica in the chat. Does anyone have favorite strong examples of instructor guides to accompany open textbooks? This is something we're working on in our grant funded textbook pathways. Um, so we, ours is so specialized to the person and their course. We don't have anything like that. Um, it's very personal. Uh, so I'm sorry, I can't add anything there. Um, I'm doing some work with BC Campus on our open course, and I know it's an expectation that we create instructor guides. So we, I know, Clint, do you have the link for, or like how, how would someone find them? I just know that I have to design it as I'm going along. Yeah, so um, I can't speak too much about it, but uh, we uh, have, uh, we have a number, uh, one of the new initiatives that I'm working on uh, with uh, Melanie Myers, my colleague at BC campus is, is now looking at, at expanding on open textbooks and creating courses that are based on open textbooks that are open courses. And one of the expectations that we have is the creation of uh, instructor guides and, and faculty focused materials on how to teach using uh, this textbook and this course. So we're just in the process of doing exactly the same thing that uh, it sounds like uh, what, uh, what, it, what is happening there. But I do want to point to uh, what I think is, is a pretty good um, facilitator guide for an open resource. And that's um, UBC and their food, the Center for Sustainable Food Systems at UBC. They have a number of uh, open courses um, and that are built around open case studies, and they do have a facilitator guide that goes along with it. Um, and and uh, I just kind of came across this as I was doing some of the work uh, research around the work that we're doing at the BC campus, and I thought this was quite good. It talked about how to use the modules, you know, which could easily be adapted to how to use this textbook, how to use this chapter, what are the guiding principles behind the creation of this material, something that uh, talks a little bit about the philosophy of the content and how to actually go about teaching with this content, so. Thank you, Clint. Uh, we'll be staying tuned for, for more coming out of uh, BC Campus on those guides. Um, I'm gonna encourage others, if you have more questions or comments to drop them into the chat and perhaps while folks are thinking, one that's been on my mind for a while has uh, just been around the, the time that it takes to design good learning experiences for our students. Now for faculty members or adjunct instructors or instructors of any kind who might not have the time it takes to completely redo their course and work alongside an instructional designer, um, are there still ways that they can work with you and make sure they start thinking about student-centric design and, and good learning experiences? and start out in that path, even if it's not a full overhaul of perhaps what they've been doing.
it might be a big question for us to, to try to answer, but I'm just yeah. curious. So well, an easy starting point for 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 faculty. I think I think our textbook affordability grants allowing for instructors to adopt a, a existing open textbook is kind of a lighter version. It's not the full out like writing your own open textbook, which some of them have done a fabulous job. Um, so just just that in itself, you know, they're not doing a complete re rehaul of their course, but they are developing like new test banks or quiz quizzes around that content. And, you know, it's an opportunity for me to like introduce them to Quality Matters and our um, course template to meet those standards and start talking about writing measurable learning objectives. Because a lot of times I'll see things like the students will understand, they'll have a awareness of and appreciation of, which those aren't measurable. So um, I would say, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be like a complete overhaul. They can mix and match and tie in like older assignments and come up with new assignments within a course doing that. Thank you, Heather. I think that's so reassuring to hear. And Verena, I'm sort of thinking about, you know, what are the ways to create the small ripples? Uh, if you and uh, or Clint have any suggestions. Um, I think it's a really, really good question because I, for example, I'm a sessional instructor with the uh, University of Calgary Workland School of Education. And I teach Actually, Kathy, yeah, yeah, good job. Alec Crow, she's picked up Alec Crow, so great open learning. I'm distracted by the chat. Um, when you are one of 12 sessional instructors, for example, like me, I have the same um, syllabus that everyone else has. So I don't have the opportunity to necessarily make those changes that I would when I teach my own courses. So what I do do, and I know that I'm advocating for Twitter today, which is kind of interesting. Um, but I do, I do have, I always have a course hashtag because what the course hashtag does, and in my introductory online survey, I say, are you interested in ed tech or are you interested in open learning? And I introduce the opportunity to look to Twitter to expand beyond the course, because you have what you need in the course, especially when everyone's doing the same thing, but you give those students who are interested the opportunity to expand in little ways. I used to also have a Twitter chat, but then I learned that that just complicates things, especially for the really regimented, everyone has the same course type of course. Um, so that's one way that, you can do it. It's just how do you bridge and actually I'll find a, a, an image to show you how do you bridge those things outside the learning management system with the learning management system. The other thing is asking students to create their own content or, or their own um, projects. So with my graduate course, I would not suggest, I will not absolutely not suggest as a beginning thing, start by everyone creating the textbook together, a press book together. That was, was incredibly difficult. I will admit it. I had multiple faculty working with me and librarians and other people. But what I have started with is just going into um, um, Wikipedia, for example, and asking the students to go in and make an edit. <laughs> the learning that they get out of joining wikipedia and making an edit when i see their reflections because i always ask my students to reflect was exactly the same as the students who wrote their own chapters in a press book but it's you don't have to do something big you can do something little that it, it was it's uncanny to see and and actually i'm sure future research would be really interesting on comparing and contrasting student perceptions and experiences so my point is just small steps can make astronomically big ripples. Um, yeah, and then I also, if you look at the ePortfolio, I put in another project that I just did and it was on designing podcasts. And these are former students who've come back and want to do more work. So the secret is not ending with your course, making learning so exciting that they wanna develop a learning relationship with you that continues beyond the course and you continue to do things with them and connect with them in different ways. That's also important. Okay, so those are some varied ideas, but no, you don't have to make a press book or <laughs> make a WordPress book. 
Good. Yeah. And, well, I'll just add a couple of things. I think one of the things, if 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 you do have, if you are in in control of any grant money at your institution, or you're able to like give out grants to instructors or faculties, try to set aside some of that money for professional development opportunities to attend conferences, to attend, you know, things that are teaching and learning or SODL resources. Uh, to to have them go there to get some ideas for for quick starts. Um, the one thing I picked up although on the question was just about uh, you know I'm, I'm an adjunct faculty member as well uh, at both Royal Roads University and also at the University of Victoria. And going back to the University of Victoria experience, um, uh, Verena and I <laughs> ended up. Uh, being brought on right around the pivot uh, because a lot of courses had to be, you know, put online very, very quickly. Uh, and we were, uh, I, I can't even remember how long we had Verena. It was so quick, but it was just like, it gives you such an understanding of what most adjuncts go through. It's like, here's a syllabus. Here's some, maybe there's some previous material from the instructor before that you can use to put together your course, but you know, you've got two weeks go and you've got, you know, 45 students, online students, and many of them who are online, not because they want to be online, but because they were pushed online. And how do you go about, you know, doing that? So I think one of the first things that Verena and I did is, is we teamed up. She had one section, I had, I had another section. And so we kind of went let's just try to mix our sections as much as possible and design for one course, even though we have multiple sections of that course. So, you know, being taking that team approach to, to doing it really helped and it saved my bacon. I, I would have been not, I would have gone nuts, you know, if I would have had to have designed this whole thing in, in essentially a couple of weeks to, to go fully online with 45 students. So that was one of the, the strategies that we had to try to divide and conquer at, at the adjunct level. Thank you all for your uh, reflections and guidance on that question. I especially appreciate how um, we're keeping sort of the human experience at the center and how we can support one another as people going about our work under stressful conditions, especially. So we have only a few minutes before the end of the hour. So if there are any pressing questions, uh, now is the time to please raise your hand or drop them into the chat. Um, I have a question that I will ask in the meantime, uh, which is focused on open pedagogy and engaging with students and, and just wanting to hear a little bit more about um, the guidance and support that you recommend or provide directly to students as they engage in some of these projects and how do you keep get them so excited that they keep back, keep coming back for more so any thoughts you can share on um, collaborating with students. I think offering them choice to pick something that they're interested in, you know, give them like, okay, here's the means to do it. And then you explore what part of the course you're interested in. Um, I think that helps um, certainly being there for them, like showing them how to use the tools and offering your support, like offering your contact information. Um, I know like the first time we did this, for some reason, the gentleman that did the video was having trouble uploading it to YouTube. So before he could get his channel up and running, I just uploaded it for him and gave him the link. And then he was able to use that in his H5P to get his interactive content started. Um, so that's my thoughts is just you know reassuring them and making sure they have your contact information. I totally like echo that, Heather. I think it's developing those relationships um, because you can't make assumptions about your students. You can you can have some guesses as you're designing, but you have to leave enough opportunity for plan B, plan C, plan D <laughs> as you're as you're teaching. Um, I think the difference is as an instructional designer, I often I'm not there when the actual course is being delivered. And so 
it's encouraging the instructor to think about plan A and B and C in that planning phase. But the reality is as an instructor, you have to be ready to follow through with plan B and C and also be human yourself and know that no matter how many different plans you make, someone does something or something happens that you have to be ready and open to kind of like you're saying other and just sort it out together and be humble and, and transparent. And I think COVID is definitely taught us that just be honest with what's going on. Yeah, um, so we we always tell them like when I'm with them, uh, meeting with them in person in the class, I give them an opt out. Like I pass around a sheet of paper and say, you know, if you don't want your name published online, you don't want your work published online, let us know. And there were like, two or three people the first time we did it that they just didn't want to do the online part of it. So, I mean, they wrote up their ideas and gave it to the instructor so she could grade it, but um, they just didn't take part in the public part. Yeah, thanks for saying that, Heather. That was the point I was going to make too, is, is, is if you're doing things in open spaces and, and you know, I'm, I, I'm a big believer, I like public sphere participation for students in, in some of the courses that I teach. So I like to have them, you know, editing Wikipedia or blogging in public and, but, you know, always giving them the option to be able to not be in public, um, to, to, to participate in different ways, which does bring up another instructional design challenge that you have and that you have to figure out how to say, maybe fairly assess students that are participating in the public and getting the benefit from doing that versus those that don't want to participate in the public. And, and you know, how, how do you make sure that those are, are assessed equally uh, uh, in, your, in your program? So, but, but it's, it's very important that you do that and give the students the opportunity to, to not participate in public if they don't want to. Thank you all so much for sharing that. Uh, since we only have a couple minutes left, I think it's time to wrap up and just say thank you again for everyone, in, including all of you who are participating in the chat and have shared your questions. Please join us in thanking Heather, Clint, and Verena. And Aperva, I will hand things to you to see if there's anything that you would like to add. Thank you, Karen, um, and thank you all of our speakers. I've learned so much and I've jotted down a lot of different uh, ideas to take back to the communities that I work with, but also conversations that hopefully we can explore at future office hour sessions. Um, and on that note, um, I might actually drop in a um, form into the chat in case all of you here at our wonderful community today have ideas for future topics you'd like us to delve into, whether it's um, instructional design and OER related, whether it's more about pedagogy, um, or if it's about nominating speakers um, and other voices that you think um, should share the office hour spotlight, um, please do drop in your suggestions. Um, as you've seen today, the conversations are very much fought and driven by community. So if you have anything that has been a pressing issue um, on, um, projects you've worked on or at your institution or in your region, um, we might want to pick up the mantle on this stage. And I will just say thank you once again to um, all three speakers and to everyone here. Uh, we will follow up as always with a recording of the session, so stay tuned for uh, more resources and information and a link to um, share this out with others in your network uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Have a good day. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.